Yeah, I think it, so. We we are in the session co-creating together with our colleague from uh, a team of University for the Planet, Sergey. Uh, maybe you can share a little bit of your story. Uh, you work with very different scales of, uh, let's say, projects, changing territories, changing, uh, let's say, working with governments, working with companies. So why do you feel like a new approach to development, or let's say something of that kind is needed? You know, hello, friends. Uh, during my work with the youth and with the development uh, uh, territories projects, I realized that we have no idea uh, what we want from our future. And we have no uh, common language for this. We have no, uh, you know, in Russia, we says that this could be a national idea for all the nation to go somewhere where it, it was. When it was USSR, we tried to go to the better future uh, where everybody will, ha will have his own flat and so on. But now we have no this dream. And uh, if, um, as Alexandra said uh, once, that um, goals for the future are like goals in football. You can play for the uh, winning a cup, but you don't play for the 10 or 20 years perspective to make your club best in the world. Right now, you are just willing to make this goal. So uh, we need a lucid dream, but very flexible dream uh, where we want to come. And this dream, as was told before on these sessions, will be some kind of different for uh, different communities. But um, we need some kind of construct construction, some kind of legal of um, our goals of our approaches uh, of our guiding lines to uh, design it uh, in a way of uh, uh, solutioning of making solutions for different uh, strategic um, tasks and for territories and for communities and for generations and for many special things that we have now and for technologies too. So for me, it's obvious uh, as if you want to make uh, a really uh, impactful projects, not for five or 10 years, but for 50 or 100. If we want to save our planet, we need a new uh, model of uh, constructing these goals. And it's not about uh, the KPI, it's about flexible system. Thank you, Sergey. So um, I would like maybe to present on behalf of our small group um, present here um, some of early ideas and then uh, move over to you colleagues uh, present here today because we, we feel that uh, whatever we're going to explore can only be co-created. It cannot be imposed and, and there is probably no single group in the world or non single institutional body that can own uh, a set of goals for for the humanity but we can have multiple let's say spaces where such exploration is happening and the more the better uh, so alexander already mentioned uh, the need for uh, the discovery of new type of goals the open ended evolving provocative and evolving with us rather than being imposed and uh, some of you may have seen uh, uh, in, in my recent publication, the book that was shared before the forum, uh, a discussion about uh, various types of challenges that we are facing as a species um, on the planetary scale. And this was also discussed today during the discussion of polycrisis and different facets of it that are threatening our collective uh, existence and our collective thriving. Um, the perspective that was brought today by uh, several speakers uh, from the first session uh, to uh, the presentation uh, where Jeremy Lent was discussing about the prospects of e ecological civilization. So I think many people uh, through, throughout the day shared this dream, uh, the possible dream of us flourishing with the earth. So that transition uh, as Erwin Laszlo indicated today, it's, it's uh, a highest potential 
uh, a possible transition and invitation into the future, but it's not guaranteed. So the idea um, that many people express is that we need some kind of scaffolding. So we have here Gail Taylor with us, who actually whose work is, is about that scaffolding on uh, for, for people to learn, but also for communities, groups and territories to learn their new pathway into the new state of being. So how can we support it? How can we scaffold that is, is an open question. Uh, in our exploration, we, we uh, do it through um, actually discovering this possible pathways of collective development, some kind of uh, steps into the future or some number of attractors that can be cultivated by communities, groups, um, what we can call ecosystems, but human and more than human ecosystems operating together. It's not the engineering approach to the future where we are supposed to build one thing, then the other thing, then the third thing. It's more actually something that Alexander was mentioning. How can we create more spaces for opportunities, nurturing spaces, life generating spaces, opportunity opening spaces. So each of those steps into the future is one of the opportunity creating spaces. Like for example, if we work on transformation of our energy systems or food production systems, or peace as a foundational culture of peace, as a foundation of everything as we discussed today, these are not just isolated elements or let's say details of a new civilizational machine. They are opportunity opening initiatives and programs that uh, by being cultivated around the world, they sort of reinforce each other. They reinforce this uh, new paradigm or the new frequency that was also mentioned in the chat right now. Um, and we started to, to chart some of these ideas, but this is very, very early sketch. And again, we should see this whole space or this whole framework as probably more a set of questions, an open-ended framework that evolves with us rather than something that is set there and is in place once and for all. But we think uh, as one of the hypotheses that um, a set of goals or principles can have uh, at least three layers that are interconnected. The layer that kind of captures these um, um, ultimate conditions of our uh, survival and, and thriving which are um, partially captured by this work that uh, Kate Robert and uh, um, the group of Stockholm Resilience Institute are doing around uh, planetary boundaries, uh, safe operation space of humanity and so on. So these are what we can call existential boundaries. They should not only include um, our relationship with the planet, which of course is broken and needs to be healed, but also relationship between ourselves, the problem that we cannot have World War III, because that, as Einstein pointed out many decades ago, will be our last war. And we cannot also afford um, evolving our technologies without having concern what, 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 what will be the outcome of using this technology. So recognizing that there are many commons that are not used adequately, that we need to co-own critical technologies for the humanity. There was the discussion between Jeremy and Ruslan today about it. All of these are elements of, of that possible future that we may want to step into and that which is, again, life uh, embracing, life opening. That's the ultimate goal. That's like uh, external boundary. Uh, then the, the, on the other hand, that is only possible if we evolve ourselves. So that's the dimension of inner development goals that was mentioned today by Alexander. And that's the work that is done by uh, a number, there, there is a core group supported by Thomas Bjorkman and Navalo of other, a number of other people. But that has to be taken in connection with other dimensions, that are both internal and external. And, and so the connecting layer is actually something similar to sustainable development goals. It relates to our highest aspirations of what we can achieve as human beings within that space of relationship with, with more than human nature and our inner nature. So that societal development goals layer is perhaps the third one. So this is, let's say, an early hypothesis about what could be done or could be framed. 
and how it should be framed, what are the key principles that we need to follow in designing such goals, what are the questions that we need to recognize, and how we can specifically organize these goals, and uh, what types of goals can we construct? Is it, should we call it goals, continue calling it, probably only for sake of kind of juxtaposting it to uh, sustainable development goals, perhaps, but we probably mean here something different, and that is so something to be explored together. And maybe last thing uh, I would like to say before turning to um, into you, dear colleagues, everyone who is present here now, is that right now we are presenting this approach, this vision as something that is just very sketchy first uh, assumptions. We want to co-create, co-explore this together as we go forward. Uh, and the next station for us will be after the forum on the 21st of November, uh, when we explicitly are going to have a session of co-creation dedicated to evolutionary development goals. So that's the last thing I would like to say. And now I would like to invite, uh, first of all, Alexander Laszlo to uh, comment on this and then perhaps the rest of the group. Alexander. Yeah, thank you. I, that was a, a good, good catch there as I raised my hand, Pavel. Thank you. Um, but, you know, this is part of the dance. Indeed, you know, Pavel was just about to pass it to everyone. I raised my hand and he changed the direction of the conversation. And this is what it means to be engaged in evolutionary development goals, not to have a fixed I'm going to do this and I'm going to ignore what else is on the pathway, but as things arise, moving with them in the flow. So I, that was a great, uh, great illustration of that, Pavel. And I think part of what I want to mention about what, what we're doing with evolutionary development goals, and again, as Pavel said, this is just the beginning. We're just sketching it out. We're sensing into the need to go beyond sustainable development goals and even sustainable development goals and inner development goals together. We need to do something more systemic. Why? Well, Pablo mentioned this and so did Sergei, but let me put a fine point on this. We have so many so, so many different types of terminology that relates to development. We have sustainable development. We have personal development. We have cultural development, national development. Goodness, you can put so many frames on this. But the bottom line, the deepest story is evolutionary development. That is the one that unites all of these different approaches, as Irvin put forth very clearly, uh, in uh, this common narrative of coherence and emergence, evolutionary development. So if we're thinking about that, and then we're looking at the very human frame of sustainable development, because it's still, how are we going to be sustainable on this planet? The, the animals and plants and the, uh, many other living things are not questing after sustainable development with us, because they're doing it in a natural way. So how are we joining their pattern? That's the evolutionary narrative, the evolutionary dream. And also in terms, as Sergei mentioned so, so, so well, goals are such, they're nouns, they're objectives. We wanna arrive at the goal or if we're playing soccer to make the goal, and then we're done. Yeah, we got it. Okay, we knew the next goal. There are things to achieve. Whereas what we're looking at in evolutionary terms is process. We don't achieve the process, we continue with the narrative. And so it's not a destination. Evolutionary development goals are not about satisfying these goals, achieving a goal. It's about humaning well, it's verbing, right? So the evolutionary frame that we're looking at in all that we're exploring here is not, as Mila mentioned so beautifully, it's not the quest that humans have had for so long about control certainty, answers, solutions. It's a very Western approach. And what we're looking for now are ways of uh, harmonizing with, co-emerging, flowing. It's a very different sense of a goal. It's not a goal that is fixed. It is a goal that is flow, right? Remember, I'm, I'm going to do it again. Here's my flow shirt. Yes. It's about the flow. <laughs> I do want to be the poster child because I'm not going to wear the same shirt tomorrow. So here we go. Any case, uh, this is it. And yeah, it does mean having fun with it because dancing the path is a celebration of life. And if we do it with too much solemnity, it becomes morbid. 
it becomes something that is a dirge. So the, the playfulness of, of the process, I think, is also very important. And this is how we explore the evolutionary development goals. The invitation that Pavel has put forward here and, and together with Sergei is let's co sense into these evolutionary development goals, these process. Uh, you know, Whitehead talks about process, wrote about process philosophy. How are we engaging in this process process? How are we the the verbs that Bohm, David Bohm talks about, right? So we're verbing ourselves into existence all the time. Many other cultures, and we'll explore some of this tomorrow. This is a little uh, plug for tomorrow's sessions. We'll explore how the non-Western frames of looking at things can help us uh, engage in uh, evolutionary development goals. And even here, the term goal is kind of in quotation marks. And all of these are uh, engaging in a common narrative and is truly that narrative of empathy and of co-creation. Hey, sorry for the lengthy part there, Pavel, but I did want to get that uh, that framing in. Thank you. Thank you. And without further ado, um, over to you. Anyone who wants uh, to share your thoughts, maybe as a warm up, I, I really enjoy the conversation happening in the chat where some people kind of already evolved the name of evolutionary development goals to developing abundance opportunities. So over like abundance opportunities, abundance development opportunity, and then developing abundance opportunity, which sort of shortened into DAO. And I think we all want to connect with DAO, or Sergei indicated a DAO law with the planet. So what's your thoughts? What do you think when you hear this idea of um, some something, some new kind of goals, or whether it's not goals or something else, some integration? Uh, Shay? Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm very interested in one of your critical boundaries in your work, uh, 100 Years a, a bridgeway about um, problems of complexity thinking and issues with complexity thinking and understanding and perceiving and engaging with complexity. So I'm um, suggesting not so much a goal, but um, education based on complexity thinking that creates the opportunity for the possibility for young people who can perceive complexity and be really comfortable with emergence and indeterminacy and all of the change that happens with complexity to be comfortable with that, that process and those dynamics as a way of being to being open uh, because I as a theorist have no idea what's going to be coming in young people's lives in the future and they don't either but the space of the possible for them to be able to have the uh, the cognitive emotional and personal ex experience embodied experience of complexity enables them to move with that with that flow no matter what they're doing no matter what field they're in whether they go into specialized science or medical areas or agriculture sustainability no matter what they're doing i think that's absolutely vital with education being a site of um, huge possibility for change huge possibility for young people for the future Thank you, Shay. Um, Just to connect for people here as well, this notion of that that Shay, I think, is 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 calling for is um, how do we how do we learn? I mean, the idea that evolution is the way the universe learns. And learning is the way humans evolve. So they're integrally related. Right? So how do we engage in this pattern that is evolutionary? Not just lifelong learning, but life-wide learning. And again, this is something we've talked about, University for the Planet. This is a key component of what we're looking to develop through the evolutionary development goals 
and then this kind of life-wide, lifelong learning with all of life, not just humans, right? But with all things that can create a thrivable, flourishing world like Gen Jeremy Lent was talking about, the ecos, uh, ecological civilization. Um, so thank you, Shay, because, because education is, oof, but formal and informal education, I think this is exactly what we're talking about. And of course, Western and non-Western education, so much to learn. Thank you. Maximo? Yeah, Welcome. haven't been keeping my camera off, but it's been a great, um, very interesting day. And I was actually really impressed by the, by the evolutionary development goals. But I did want to raise a point because, for example, when I was looking at the uh, today, like these three days um, of events, and um, which are very holistic in all the different perspectives, but something that I'm actually working on currently, and they, I was missing from the sessions, was what is the role of the public sector in all of this, right? Because we've, we've been talking about many different perspectives, and I'm, for example, I'm a fan of um, Mariana Matsukato and you know, mission-oriented policymaking and the fact that, you know, we've been living for far too long for the market to solve things. We know that doesn't work. I know that in this community, we love, um, you know, grassroots movements. And I do think that grassroots organizations are the sorts of, um, you know, initiatives that we, many of us are part of, um, do are pioneers that do lead the way in showing what's possible, right? Like what we're doing here, imagining what's possible. But at certain point we need you know those taxes we need you know we need so i mean that's a reflection right that i would love us also to have and how do they you know how can we maybe you know embed some of these evolutionary development goals in some of the you know policy agendas maybe you know how can that happen you know that'd be definitely a reflection i'd love to have at some point um, um Thank you, Massimo, for bringing this up. And I think that directly connects also to presentation that Mila earlier did today, the opportunity that lies with governments that are ready to evolve and hold the bridge, so to say. Um, in, in my book, which I mentioned already today as well, uh, I'm talking about the role of bridge builders. So the bridge is something that connects the present reality and that emerging attractor that uh, Ervin uh, and Jeremy were talking about today. But how to move there, how to get there, it's, uh, it's, it's a cultural shift. It cannot be accomplished by hierarchical structures. It cannot be done by uh, corporations. It needs everybody's involvement. But somebody has to hold the space for that involvement, involvement to happen. and, and uh, um, and kind of carry people across or create conditions that they move across. And that can be the role of those bridge builders, which are uh, necessarily those who connect with the public sector. It cannot be private players. It can only be um, those who are in touch with commons. So, Mila, maybe I could put a little bit of spotlight on you when asking what, what's your thinking about it? What, what do you think when you think about the potential? I agree with you 100%. Yeah. It's the commons because, and look, out of it should come out the vibrant private life of creating businesses, opportunities, communities, uh, schools, uh, you know, um, in other words, alternatives and choices for the people, but out of the commons that what we need to tend to. Because if you look at, for example, historically, and I'll reflect on the technology that I talked about earlier, um, say um, World Wide Web and Internet, it was all publicly funded. I'm just talking US, publicly funded. Up until the point it was scaled, the minute it was scaled, it was privatized, co-opted. I mean, I can freely say that. And then look, um, we continue the fight. You can say it's a nice evolutionary spin. <laughs> but the problem here is not the fact that we have contrast 
that something is producing contrast, that we have some kind of injustice, so you have to write it and fight for your rights. I mean, it, it keeps the evolutionary wheel spinning, but it's generating conflict. That's where the problem is. It's generating disparity, inequality, poverty, conflict, us going at each other's throats, <laughs> pitching us into conflict and pitching us against each other, the very same invention that we funded we are, um, it's, di it's disowned. We are disowned from it or um, estranged or alienated or removed from it. And then we take it for granted. And we're talking only internet, but it's always been like that. And not to mention the fact that, you know, the movie Oppenheimer brought that to the center. Most of the research has been, you know, um, also coming for the, the, the motivation and the funding comes from military interests. So you have a straight on biosocial conflict that all of our systems, even our psychology is based on. This is why we mentioned transactional economy. This is why we speak about extraction, exploitation of one gender over another, one demographic over another region, country. We over nature, uh, we even saving nature instead of what we are doing today and what repeatedly, for example, Pavel and Alexander, repeatedly, Alexander would be always very clear, we're co-emergent with this earth. We're co-emergent. Anywhere else, anything else, it's not the same species, okay? And this is key. So in terms of business and why I agree so much with Pavel and why I'm so passionate about this is because I see what's emerging. And what is emerging, I want to quickly say, Within the conscious technology, the greatest richness is in the being. The greatest power is in the connectivity, in the linkages, okay? The greatest wars will be fought over identity. You think we're already there? And even the image that I showed you of the, of the, uh, of the man with the antenna in his skull, um, Immediately, you want to stake claims and create your identity and create a foundation that will protect that identity and it's all great. It's all fantastic. But I have this paradoxical place with you to, to explore now. What, what happens if the very diversity and inclusivity becomes co-opted? That's, that's, I like to, I like to think in paradoxes because this is our only chance before it is fully unleashed or organized and privatized. Because you can, the, the, the system that is generating this intelligence and there are different grades of intelligence and let me just tell you straight up, it's the convergence of technologies. It's not just AI, it's you know narrow AI, generative AI, super intelligence and it all hinges on the level and the threshold when AI starts asking its own questions and setting its own goals. Make sense? That's the threshold. And yeah, it's not you. You know, just something, some external force. It will be not even a device. All of this knowledge, all of our collective ingenuity will be harnessed into not a device, an organism, the size of one blood cell. You will not know who you're talking to. <laughs> so it's not a machine. It's augmented superhuman, transhuman. But are we gonna be extra humane in that transhuman? That's the point. And that's what Pavel was talking about. You're pouring new technology into an old molding, old marketing system, old military system, or money system, or market system, and all mindset system. This is the where the disparity lies. And this is the chance is to explore these difficult questions, um, very difficult questions, but we are the ones deciding. And this was one of the reasons why I put myself um, frankly, when I was approached by government to <laughs> do this work, I was very leery, I'll be honest with you. Um, and they waited for five months uh, for my decision. And after asking many lucid questions to see if this is genuine, 
Uh, and once I got that genuine feedback face to face with conversations with people, I said, okay, now I can get to work. And believe me, um, most of the time one feels like a lonely voice in the wilderness until something shows up and the children are showing up. But that's the second coming. Can um, I build on, on something you said, if I may, Pavel, also? Um, yes, so Massimo, just to kind of set up the scene, we are approaching the end of the session because we agreed that it will only run for 45 minutes. I know that we will not cover just with scratching the surface. I know that you want to say something and Peter want to say something. So please go ahead and then we'll give word to Peter and then we are going to wrap it up. Please. Yeah, no, just, just to, you know, get back to her to that diversity, you know, how do we align in that diversity, which I think is great. And I mentioned that work of the mission-oriented policymaking, which I think is a great aligner. You know, Mila, you mentioned how the internet was created. That was right in the in the um, in the mission of going to the moon, right? So it was like we had that mission, and then lots of things happened around that mission. So I wondered to bring it back to you and the evolutionary development goals and how to operationalize this. That could be my um, challenge to you or to us. Like, can we? <clears throat> Can we make a mission? Can these be missions, right? And because, for example, I'm I'm currently facilitating a, per, um, a European consortium called Net Zero Cities. So, for those of you that, that that don't know, in the European Union has now some interesting missions, like let's decarbonize 100 cities for 2030. Now, are we going to make it or not? We don't know, but at least we have a mission, right? That requires everybody, right? Requires to align private sector, public sector funds, etc. We need to be smart, creative, but we have a goal. So now with the evolutionary development goals, you have created that vision, right? We need those learning ecosystems or we need to avoid um, certain catastrophes. The question for me always is like, how do we turn this into a roadmap, right? That actually aligns people in a, you know, in a practical procedural way. So that would be anyway, that would be my reflection. Let's turn this into something that can actually be a consortium and let's work towards these things as, as a humanity. Maybe that's the new UN that we need. And I don't know, just let me know up there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Massimo. And Peter, please. Um, Thank you. been holding um, your hand for a while. Thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm in my car in an aerospace institute about to take a biomimicry course, having delayed my participation in Jeremy Lent's deep transformation course through Gaia University. I say that only because I'm a intergenerative transdisciplinary diviner and activist and academic, and I know mainly in this conversation, um, Alexander. My points, uh, first children, Mia, Yes, this is um, an issue where I think whatever processes, and it is processes and it is verbs, we need to make this an intergenerative, intergenerational issue. We have to extend our sense of time by making sure we are inclusive to celebrate the diversity of, of people across age. In that space, playing, to, to echo that verb, is absolutely key. Adults can be far too serious. Kids and grandparents, I know I am one, get together, they play, they think creatively. So the, these, these Evo Devo, may I call them that? that that's, a, that's a challenge to you. Goals need to reflect um, the play aspect that has already been said by other people. And finally, as the founder of intergenerational schools, I absolutely believe that learning is key learning should be playful. We have squeezed the juice and the passion and the purpose out of education. And if we can't recapture that aspect of being human, I'll say something risque. You know, the biological process of procreation is thought by most to be pleasurable. Somehow learning as a cultural vehicle for change ought to be as pleasurable in that space as perhaps the creation of new children. So playing, learning, intergenerational, that's my contribution to add and to emphasize the wonderful thoughts I've been hearing uh, at this conference so far. Thank you for giving me the time. Fantastic. Thank you, Peter. I like I like this very inspirational uh, image of uh, a joy we extract from uh, learning. 
together. And I hope um, as we approach the end of this session, that will be the case in our next two days and the journey we're going hopefully to take together. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. It's been a very rich, uh, intense day and many of you stayed here nonstop. So I believe now you need a good rest. Thank you uh, for this first day we began. I have mentioned that this uh, space we are creating here is really just the beginning of, of that journey. Uh, there will be two more days of conversations happening, but we are not only for conversations, we are here for action, we are for collaboration, we are for practical work, which begins nevertheless with conversations. So that's the start of it, but then has to move further. And thank you, Maximo, for bringing up the idea of consortium. Let's explore that. Uh, and um, in uh, again, as a kind of next point on our map, in uh, one month from now, we are going to hold explicitly a co-creation session around evolutionary development goals, where we hope to see uh, many of you joining. Thank you for our first day. Thank you to those who opened it up, who has supported it with your comments, uh, attention, your shared work. Thank you to Alexander as being the lovely co-host throughout the whole day and the whole team that uh, Nick, uh, Sergey, and uh, others who were making it uh, happening. And of course, our uh, team in the background, including uh, people who translated it into Russian and into Spanish. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, the audience. <laughs> everyone who contributed uh, today uh, was a lovely first day. There will be two more. Please join us tomorrow, three o'clock uh, CST, Euro Central European time. And uh, that's just the beginning. Have a great end of the day. Okay.